Hey everyone, BT. Today, David and I are going inside study where you're going. This is a very interesting conversation as they all are, but it gives us a glimpse into what David's mindset is when it comes to how he studies. And he's able to pull the most obscure information for you know a variety of different industries, whether it's sports, whether it's entertainment, whether it's history. He's always looking for how that can affect and help him learn something new so that he can bring that to you. And I just think it's really super cool. Cool. And he also shares a few titles of some things that he's listening to now that's always really fun. So come inside and check this one out. I really think you're going to enjoy it. Hey everyone, BT and welcome to Inside the Episode. Today, David and I are going inside the episode titled Study Where You're Going. Yes, we are. So this is a study in where we're going. And we never know where we're going when we get on this podcast. So I we think that's fun. We never know what we're studying. I think it's really good. Well, we always know what we're studying. We just don't know where I'm, where <laughs> where I'm going to pull the yeah, questions from, right? Where is this going to lead to? Where is oh, this going to lead? Well, there. let's start by talking about the episode and what it's centered around. And that was the importance of studying yep. and how it relates to the successful mind, which is why most of you are here. So, David, you're known for your seven years of study. Anybody who's listened to this podcast knows it very, very intently, that story. It helped you break through in all those early years of your own business. Can you share why studying where you're going is so important to becoming a success? Yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting thing because I would have, if, if you'd have said to me, here's a gamble for you, right? Uh, if I can convince you that at some point in your life you are going to love studying, um, listen, I would have smacked you in the mouth, I think. No when, way. I, when I was a kid, I hated it. I mean, I hated yeah. reading books, didn't like it. There were some things I liked to read, but not. But most of all, like I was like a dead student. I, my mind was somewhere else. I don't know where I was, but my mind was somewhere else. And today I'm a voracious reader. So, But, here's, but to answer your question... Um, we have to understand that by the time we're aware of what we're thinking, uh, which starts around seven years old, we have already been programmed with so much information and everything that we're aware of at that point. If you just look at a seven-year-old, all the things a seven-year-old has been exposed to, all the meanings that have been given to everything that that kid's been exposed to come from somebody else. So if you... If you are going through your life and you're, number one, you're having problems, you're, you're stuck, you're not getting the results that you want, you have a lot of questions, things don't seem to make sense to you, there is a prob probably a pretty good indication that it didn't make sense to your parents either and they had the same kind of problems and your grandparents had the same kind of problems and their parents had the same kind of problems. Human beings give meaning to everything. There is nothing that has any meaning outside of the meanings that human beings give things. So we developed language as human beings. Um, we developed uh, all kinds of awarenesses that we now pass along as education to other individuals. But we have to realize that somebody else told us what these things mean and they told us how to do things. So if we don't study, you're just taking it on faith that you were given the correct information about everything. And what we know is, is that there's so much information out there that can make a person's life better that did, doesn't necessarily come from our parents. But if you don't study, you're not going to get to that information. You're not going to know about these things. If you want to in, you know, better your life at all, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't even have to be you know, consciousness. I mean, if you want to learn how to build cars, you have to study. The information is here, but you have to study to get to it. So if you want to advance your life or make it better, you have to study. Yeah, and I love the concept of studying for where you're going, not for necessarily where you are. Because it's to me, it, it makes it feel as if, you know, I want to look at people who maybe have the success that I want, or I want to figure out what they have that I can work towards. And when you're studying from where you're going, it's really basically saying, look, that's where I'm headed and that's where I want to get to. So I think it's really cool that you do bring that in. And I also like the correlation between your seven years of study and how at, at seven years old, we've been imprinted right. with all these things that are going on around us. I think that's a very cool uh, tie back. Well, you take every opportunity to study people from all walks of life and across many different industries. Um, you especially enjoy studying hugely successful people from you know film, television, music, sports. It runs the gamut. 
What are some of those that stand out to you the most and some you'd recommend for others to dive into? Like, And I know that's kind of tricky because people have different interests and wants, but is there somebody who along the way sort of ignited your passion for learning more about how they got to be so successful? Wow. That's a lot. Because you are, well, because like you just said, you're a voracious reader, so you study everyone under the sun. Yeah, so so let me just double down on something that you said. I think that a person needs to look in the direction that they want to go first, and then I know you're going to find the people that you're interested in. There are so many people, T. Um, man. Well, I know that you've talked at length on this show about uh, someone like, I believe it was uh, Versace was one that you studied. You've gone into, you've gone deep into. Oh, like, it was Lagerfeld. Oh, so, Lagerfeld. Yeah. I'm sorry. Ver- what, yeah, so, 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 okay. So let me answer. Let me, let me uh, answer that reference. There are a couple of people that I have found very, very interesting in the way that they've lived their life. And I've done a, a real deep dive uh, into them as an individual. And Carl Lagerfeld was one of them. Keith Richards is one of them. There's, there's, a, there's a few that I have. And what's interesting about these individuals is that they really lived, and, and they somehow or another they discovered this relatively early, but they lived most of their life really steeped in living the way that they wanted to live and really didn't give a shit about what anybody else thought and came up with their own philosophies for life, you know, their own code, so to speak, or whatever. Um, But as I began to study some of these people, what I found, and I didn't actually expect to find this, I found how aware they were about universal principles and ideas and probably never actually studied those principles themselves. With Lagerfeld, maybe. With Richard's, Probably not, but um, the but the, here's so here's what I was looking for. What is it? What was the thing or the situation or circumstances in their life where they decided that they were going to accept themselves for who they were and the way that they wanted to live and what they believed in, regardless of what other people thought? And you hear you have two very different people. Like you couldn't get any more different than Keith Richards and and Karl Lagerfeld. And the way that they chose to live their life, they basically said, fuck you, to everybody else around them uh, and lived exactly the way that they wanted to live. And of course, they're two hugely successful people and they're, they're successful in very different areas. But everybody that I have studied this way is the same thing. They're extremely successful in what they do, but at some point in their life, they really accepted who they were. They got to know who they were, and they're like, this is who I am, and I don't care what anybody else, what anybody else thinks. The interesting thing about these individuals is that they have been able to go through difficulties and different situations that would bring most people down that didn't touch them at all. And uh, like Carl was one of the most outspoken people in a negative way, like he he really would say some really negative things about individuals that he didn't like. He did not sugarcoat it. And he seemed to have like no ramifications for this in his career. He just became more and more and more and more um, successful. And he was a very intelligent man. He was prolific in his industry all the way up until he died. He, you know, he had an incredible work ethic. Um, and, and Richard's, you know, kind of the same way, the very different things. Um, so the idea was, so, so let me just make this record. I'm not going to like say more people. What I'm, my recommendation is, is that you look for people that are very successful in what you're interested in. And I guarantee you, somewhere along the line, you're going to find individuals that are like that. And the key component is not what they did. It is that they accepted themselves. So um, what I know over a long period of time, one of the biggest difficulties for people in life is that they do not accept who they are. They have so much flawed information about mistakes that they've made, how they were brought up, what they did or didn't do, that they have a very difficult time removing shame, guilt, um, negative views of things that you know they've experienced to really say, you know, I'm really great with who I am and this is how I want to live my life. And I think that that is a big key in a person's happiness and the fulfillment that they feel about what they do in life. Yeah, I think that's great. And what I love about all of that 
is that you are open to learning from anyone yeah. who may have a message to you. I think that's, and because you have embodied that I am who I am and this is who I'm going to be. And that opens it up to a myriad of different places. Like you said, music, sport, film, television, historical individuals. When you were talking, it reminded me of when you introduced me to Chef Francis Malman, mm. who is another person who just kind of lived his life. And you did a great episode I'll call back to at this point, um, episode 155, The Edge of Uncertainty, where you kind of talked a little bit about his work. And and I know that you you studied him, you went and had you know dinner with him, you cooked with him, you did all these things. And that is the level of your study and you want to get to know these people on a level that what makes them tick and you you apply yourself and implant yourself inside their lives and you make these interesting choices and I just love it I think it's so important because you can learn see I I tend to shut off the supply sometimes like if there's someone in like when you say Carl Lagerfeld I have no interest at all in learning about him but I guarantee you that if I listened to him I'd fall in love with a piece of it but there's a part of me and there may be a part of a person out there listening that they shut themselves off to that and I guess we should probably not do that because there's a lesson in there somewhere right there's certainly a lesson well the part of it would be what is what level are you shutting yourself off and what's actually behind that and it's usually some place you don't want to go inside of yourself yeah. like all of a sudden they trigger something and, and you're like I'm done I don't I don't want to hear anymore you know I'm, I'm done and you judge it you make them wrong or whatever and then you're you're out of there and I think that well I know I experienced that very early on and I kept pushing past it um, because I was like why is it that all of a sudden I hit this place and I'll judge this person? And I'm talking a long time ago. This is in the 90s. But then I started pushing past it and I said, okay, we stop judging what they believe. Ask yourself, why do they believe what they believe? How did they get to that belief? Instead of going, this person's just an idiot for believing that and not really understanding what's behind it. And I think that's where I started to get probably the most value from studying other individuals was that instead of judging what, even if I don't agree with it, right? Why do they believe what they believe? Like what has led up to this for them to form this belief in their life? Yeah, and, and and it's so funny. I'm kind of smiling over here because I was thinking about when I was first introduced to Relentless by Tim Grover. As you know, I hated that book. You did. This, this guy was coming on. He was telling me I wasn't good enough. I wasn't fast enough. Yeah. I wasn't big enough. He was basically, he wasn't even calling me a piece of shit, but I was interpreting it as such. And it's turned out to be one of my favorite books of all time because I got through that initial, you know, moment of trigger and realized that there's something that can be learned in here. Put aside your judgment and bullshit and just listen to the message. And after that, I'm like, God, I fucking love this guy. It's just so funny. But I, I even a bit, if I would have gone with my initial instinct, I never would have picked it up. Yeah. There's something there for everybody. You don't have to be a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant. Exactly. Um, and, and there's something that you can take away from it that will make your life better. Yeah, totally. And his new book, Winning, is every bit as good, so pick that up as yeah, well. Yeah. All right, so in the episode, you talked about how we usually only see the end result of a person we may be emulating, but rarely we see their journey. Like, we get their highlight reel, right? You know, the whole idea of uh, there are no such things as an overnight success. These people are busting their asses yeah. to get to where they're at. You don't see the blood, sweat, and tears on the court or behind the scenes at the, you know, trying to get auditions to break in. Um, Can you talk more about the illusion we see in others and how it actually can be detrimental to a person's growth? You mean from a success standpoint? From a success standpoint, yeah. Yeah, so the interesting thing about that is that we're raised um, in a society that, you know, we really really are, we celebrate celebrity and success, and I think that we're, um, we're, we are in a delusion around it because... We only see it once it is a celebrity or a success. So these people seem magical to us in some way. You see them at the height of what caused them to be so popular and usually in the, in the prime of their career, so to speak. Um, and when we do that and we don't teach people what they actually had to do to become that, then there's this massive difference between them and us. And the truth is there is no difference between them and us. It's just that you have a person that's worked really hard and dedicated themselves to something, and that's what anybody can do if they do that. But when we get to that point, there's this idol worship that takes place, and it gets very unhealthy 
for individuals to start viewing other people like that. Number one, it's an unhealthy viewpoint of anything. And you're seeing something that you wish you could be, but you're probably thinking there's no way that I'll ever be that. And in many cases, you're right. Like, well, well, like in in um, uh, in Relentless, like uh, Grover said, you'll never be a Michael Jordan. And I'm sure that there were people that were listening to that and felt deflated by him saying that because they were listening to it hoping that they could be a Jordan. Right. Well, that's the unhealthy side of it, right? We don't want people to be another Jordan. We want people to be the best them they be. that they can be. And if they get focused on the idol worship of the individual of what they're doing or whatever, and then the other side of it is the partying lifestyle or the celebrity lifestyle that goes with so much of that. And they want to do that, but they don't really want to do what that person does for a living. It was like Jordan said in uh, um, uh, The Last Dance, he talked about you saw him filming this thing when he was younger and he said, you know, you, you always say you want to be like Mike, but if you got to see what I did 365 days a year, you'd see that it wasn't all that much fun, right? Because you see him for an hour at a basketball game and then the rest of the week he's in the gym killing himself in order to be uh, uh, prolific for that, for that one hour. You want the celebrity of the hour, but you don't want to do what he did in the gym for the rest of the week. And it's the same way with every celebrity. You don't see the work that they're putting in behind the scenes to become that. So we get attached to the star quality, but not the process. And people need to learn the, pro you have to fall in love with the process if you if that's what you want in your life. And I think that being a celebrity just to be a celebrity is extremely unhealthy. It's coming from somebody who wants to be better than everybody else just for the sake of being better because they don't feel good about themselves the way they are right now. And we need to work as a society on helping people feel good about who they are so that they can become the best that they can be. Yeah, and what I love about that is is that it translates to anybody who's listening to this podcast. We're not we're not saying you need to be in sport or in entertainment. This is being the best you you can be, showing up for whatever job you're in, right. or whatever business you're running. Like you can be the Jordan of your business, but you've got to put in the work. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck is they want the they want the highlight reel, they want the Instagram life, they want the bling, but they don't want to put in the time. You know, they don't see Kobe Bryant finish up a game where he scores 30 points and 15 boards but then he didn't feel he did enough but he went out after the game and shot for three hours in the gym you know right. the you don't see that and I think everybody could probably go back in their story somewhere along the line where they said I'm just not willing to sacrifice that much and through that sacrifice that could have been the difference for them being elite being those cleaners right. like uh, you know Grover talks about the other thing that that is really starting to develop with it is that there's this whole idea that it's not fair that they would have to do that much work to be that. And they want somebody to advance them to that position without having to do the work and the dedication in their life. And where they got this idea that it's not fair is insane. Like it is, it is this, this cancerous growing of entitlement in our society that causes people to think like that. We're not entitled to anything. In this life, if you want something, you have to work toward it to become it. Nobody's going to promote you to that thing and then you get to be the celebrity. That's not how it works. Yeah, and that, that the sooner we can get beyond that, the better because that you're right. That is a cancerous, you know, just it's just eating us inside out. Yeah, and again, back to the topic. If you don't study, you're never going to know any of this, right? right? Because you're hearing just false bullshit information from the streets. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you also talked about uh, core wounds, and I love it when you talk about core wound on the, on the show because I think a lot of people resonate fully with this because everybody's got some sort of a core wound that they're, that they're dealing with. Um, and the unconscious patterns that's repeating over and over again, and if you don't do something about it, it just gets progressively worse. And for example, worthiness is a core wound so many people have running in the background. And we repeat that pattern because we're not aware for one, and it's far too uncomfortable to deal with for the second. You know, we just don't want to deal with the fact that we don't feel worthy. So how do we know if we're blindly following a core wound if it's not even in our awareness? Because you'll keep repeating the same problems over and over again. So we always have problems all of our life. We're going to have problems. We're going to have challenges. We're going to have to thing, have things that we overcome. But when we have the same problem over and over and over and it's not changing, something is driving that problem. And 
when you break it down to why would a person continue to experience the same problem without changing it, it goes against the cycle of nature itself. The idea is that nature is constantly correcting itself to, to move forward. Human beings are supposed to be learning from their mistakes, getting better, and then moving forward. So when we don't do that, there's something else driving it. And when you look at it, it, it is, it's a core wound pattern in a person that keeps driving that mistake. Now, why would it drive the mistake? Because at some point in your life, you learned how to live through whatever scenario caused this core wound and develop a pattern to stay safe. So you move from childhood to adulthood and you don't, you have, if you have not learned a pattern how to be successful in that situation, the only option, the only alternative is for your subconscious mind to run the core wound pattern. So you keep, even though you don't like the problem, you keep recreating it because there's a level of certainty and safety that is built into your experience around it. And that's why you keep doing it over and over again. Yeah. So if somebody out there is repeating the same, you know, the same problem over and over and over again. Maybe they're just barely making it from month to month to month. They really need to kind of drill down and see what it is, what programming it is. It, I've heard this been said before, and this may have been true for me early on, is, you know, I don't want to make more than my parents did because my parents worked so hard for that. And then they, they just barely make enough, even though their parents were near poverty level, like my mom barely made a wage. And I was, you know, you're afraid to maybe supersede them or you don't want to make more than your friends or, you know, you kind of bring yourself down to that level and that is so not in abundance. That is not good thinking to get right, into. Right, right. All right, well, let's transition a little bit to rejection. This is always a fun topic because rejection is very painful. Uh, how does one start to overcome rejection? And I'm thinking if you could provide some like tried and true strategies where a person can become more comfortable with being rejected, especially when it comes to like selling your product or on sales calls. Yeah. So in, so again, this was something that I was able to move through by studying and learning what was actually going on. So when you're rejected, no, nobody likes rejection. And but when you are rejected, what's happening is that the rejection is confirming something about yourself that you believe is true, that you don't like, or that hurts, right? So, of course, when we're, if we're going to do something in our life that constantly puts us in um, the possibility of being rejected over and over again, just like when a person starts in sales, I mean, you're going to be rejected right. over and over again, that is not going to be a pleasant experience. So one of, the, one of the first things is to understand that when you're rejected, it has nothing to do with you. And I know that's very difficult to understand because when you're rejected, it feels like it has everything to do with you. You're in a pain that is in how you see yourself. The person is just doing something that's causing you to see that pain more. When a person rejects you, they're rejecting whatever's not working for them. That's all that it is. It has nothing to do with you personally. So the idea is that if we want to learn more about it, we have to kind of start to study, number one, what is it inside of an individual that causes them to feel pain around rejection? And one of the things is shame, right? So um, when, whenever a human being does something that uh, uh, causes them to feel bad about themselves or, or what they've done, you're dealing with, you're basically dealing with shame and guilt. And that's because you were made wrong for doing something, something that you did as a child, and you basically had a scenario like this. You did something wrong. Somebody said, you should be ashamed of yourself, or you should feel guilty about doing that. Well, the human being doesn't naturally know how to do that, so it gets modeled to us, <clears throat> excuse me, as to how we should feel. We should feel bad about ourselves. So what does it look like to feel bad about yourself? And then you go into modeling what you experience with others feeling bad about themselves. And then you actually take on that persona as an individual. The problem is, is it does not allow you to grow and start feeling really confident and good about yourself. So when we're doing this, step one is to understand it has nothing to do with the person. Step two is to understand that it's showing you where you need to grow inside of yourself. So then the idea is that you know, either you start studying or you get with somebody that can help you learn about yourself so you can really understand what is it that's going on inside of me that makes me feel bad when somebody does something. Because the, the false belief is this, somebody else is making me feel this way. 
The truth is I'm feeling this way because there's something in myself that I don't like. And when something goes wrong in a very specific set of circumstances, my unconscious reaction is to feel bad about myself. So what we want to do is we want to get help to find out what that is so that we can heal it and actually begin to move forward. And there's lots of different ways a person can go to therapy. You could you could do it through reading self-help books. There's a lot of great information out there. You could get a coach or a mentor. You could start getting very introspective with yourself. See, I think that, and I honestly believe this, we know what the problem is and we also know the solution if, if, excuse me, if we would be really honest with ourselves. And the problem is, is that most people won't because it's easier to blame other people. It's easier to say, you made me feel that way, damn it. You have to change so that I can feel better. And that just isn't going to happen. No, no, absolutely not. And and that is that is a next level awareness that's available to every single human on this planet. It is. Every single person has that ability within them to realize nobody's doing anything to you. I mean, within reason. You know, when they when you you just said you made me feel bad. No, nobody makes you feel bad. You are feeling bad about something that that person said. And remembering it's not about you. That's one of the biggest lessons that I continue to work on daily yeah. in my life. When something comes up that I feel like something someone did something to me right it was me being triggered by something inside myself that's too uncomfortable to look at right because because consciously we have a choice as to how we feel correct when we unconsciously feel bad about something it's because there's a program in us that says feel bad when this happens that can be changed yeah. that literally can be changed yeah 100 percent Well, over the course of the last 16 months, with so many of us stuck at home, there was a tremendous opportunity to use the time either in a productive way or a non-productive way. I mean, overnight, we found ourselves at home, away from the workplace, with all sorts of distraction at our disposal. Knowing you, it was being productive to study and learn. Like, you took that time to study and learn, especially since businesses and your business included had to pivot in order to, you know, stay ahead of the pandemic. Yeah. Walk us through what that was like for you and maybe what you learned now looking back at it as we start to go out into the world as normal. So the first thing was understanding what was happening on um, the level of pattern behavior around the world. So I wasn't, I mean, I was concerned about, you know, the virus and, and all of that, but I was really looking at, okay, what is, based on how everybody's responding to this from a government perspective, what is this shutting down for individuals? And what became very apparent was that the way that we view safety and security in our world is through the way that we give and receive the things that we need, money, products, services, that type of thing. What concerned me the most was that was changing very rapidly, and we had never experienced anything like that. Now, what I know is that when the subconscious mind does not have a pattern for a new experience, it is going to go in to recreate something from the past. And if it can't recreate something from the past, it is going to freeze. And a lot of people just froze. They didn't know what to do. Now, when they freeze, that leaves them open to all different kinds of things. So that's why we saw so much, so many negative things actually begin to happen. So my first response was, how can I help other individuals process through this where they understand that they do have options and how do we help move their mind so that they have options? So I was telling people one of the first things is to be, to be grateful, to, to really practice gratitude in this, to understand what has changed and what has not changed. How has that change affect, affected your business? Because we work so much with business people. How can you take your business and actually help people during this, during this change? And then for me, the study process has been, it's still the same. You know, where am I going in, in my career and what it is that, that I'm doing? So I didn't study as much about um, what it is that people are actually experiencing, but more it is trying to understand where are we going to go after this. And I'm still studying that, right? I'm watching what's happening. I'm watching what's, what people are doing. I'm watching the people that have come out of this really good, and I'm watching the people that are struggling. So a lot of the study is really trying to understand the human nature around how we're going to adapt to this long term 
over a period of time. Because this is one of those things that we're going to see the short-term impact, but there's also going to be a long-term impact that I don't think anybody understands the seriousness of yet. And I think that's what's going to be really interesting and where we have to keep our eyes open. Yeah. And what's interesting about the whole thing was that the foundation was laid very early on for this, even though you didn't know it would be this specific right. thing, a global pandemic, but it, the foundation for your study and the foundation for you to be able to navigate through it was already laid early on because you've gone through similar things, maybe not to this extent, well, different but crises. different crises, yeah. right? Yeah. So you had, you had kept your study routine all throughout where other people were looking at it as, well, this is an extended vacation. I'm just going to blow through Tiger King, right? On Netflix right. or whatever. And I, I did my fair share of that too. <laughs> but you also had a chance to kind of see where people are going and you're still doing that to this day. And to your credit, you worked, I mean, you were a hardworking content creator before for that. And then I just saw you double, triple, quadruple down right. on it and it continues to go forward from here. So it's just really interesting now that we're able to connect the dots going backwards to see how we went through that and how uh, interesting of a situation that was. Yeah. And there's still more to come. So oh. it's not like it's completely over, but you're right. We're Very. keeping an eye on that. All right. Uh, last one, because we know you're a voracious reader or in most cases nowadays, a voracious listener. Uh, uh, what are you listening to right now? Would you mind sharing some things maybe that the people out there would be interested in uh, taking a listen to? Um, well, currently, um, so about once a year, I have a book that I really enjoy that I usually listen to about once a year. It's called The Beautiful Fall uh, by Alicia Drake. It's not so much a self-improvement book, but it's, it's really about the fashion industry in the 70s in Paris. And um, uh, it's a favorite book of mine. I, I just love the, the, the people that are in it. I mean, uh, they're all people that we've heard of before. So I, I, it's, a, it's, just, it's, a, it's a fun listen, right? So, but let me tell you. And you said that was books. called The Beautiful Fall? Mm, yeah, The Beautiful Fall. Got to be sure to link to that Drake. One. So I just read The Revolt of the Public. And let me give you, if I can find the yeah. author. Ah. That is by Martin. Uh, man, I don't know. Can Did you, you say can, Revolt of the Public? Yeah, can you read that? Revolt of the Public by Martin Geary. Yeah. Okay. Got yeah, it. so I just finished that one. And uh, let's see. What is the other one that I finished just recently? I mean, you find the most obscure titles sometimes, but they're always so good. <laughs> yeah, The Evolution of Desire by David Buss. And where do you find these? Do they just come up or you <clears throat> search like... Um, where do I find them? You know, very often one thing kind of leads to another. Like so, similar, like people who read this like this as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah, so, I would, so The Revolt of the Public, I was listening to a podcast and somebody had mentioned uh, that it was a really good book to read. Uh, they gave some enlightenment into what's happened with uh, the media industry, sure. you know, over a period of time. And I don't remember how I came across the evolution of desire. I, I, I don't remember where I heard that, but I did hear it somewhere. And that's how I that's how I picked that up. So that, that's the last two books I read. And I read both of those in a week. I love it. Yeah. And in, in some of, like you said, the beautiful fall, you've listened to that repeatedly. Like you learn, you probably enjoy it, but you also learn something new each and every time. Well, as well. like, well, like I said, it, it is, it is the early, uh, is part of the early story of Carl, Carl Lagerfeld. Lagerfeld. Yeah. And so it's a very interesting perspective on some of the things that made him the person that he became. Yeah. But it, it's a cool story. Like I it's, it's, it. it's a really interesting story about, um, not just fashion, but how society was changing during that period of time. And there was a big change taking place that affected a lot of the world, but it was kind of isolated in Paris for a while. Sure. So it's just a cool story. Love it. Yeah. We'll link to each one of those titles you just mentioned below. Appreciate you sharing that because I know that the people who listen to this podcast, they love your recommendations. I'm sure they're going to dive into these titles and find something that's going to take them from where they are to where they want to go. Absolutely. So, man. Perfect. Well, thanks for coming inside. You bet. Hey, that's a wrap. Study where you're going. We hope you got a lot out of it. Do yourself a favor. Smash that like button if you're not a subscriber already. And also share this with someone who would benefit from listening. We know that we've got a huge following out there. You're a great great audience. We love bringing you this content and we can't wait to bring you more. Also, leave us a comment down below and let us know what you're studying, maybe what you're studying for or what you're studying right now, whether it's a book, a documentary or something else. David would love to hear it. So until the next time, we can't wait to see you on the next Successful Mind Podcast.